Hello and welcome. Last week we looked at chapter 47 and we saw how after Jacob and his family had come to Egypt, Jacob appeared before Pharaoh and blessed Pharaoh. And we saw that although Jacob was an old man and, and he appeared before what probably was the, the, the mightiest, wealthiest monarch in that day, he could bless him. Because spiritually, Jacob was higher than Pharaoh, was over Pharaoh. The lesser is blessed by the better. We've looked at that last week. And then in the second part of the chapter last week, we saw how Joseph dealt with Egypt, how the Egyptians first bought grain for their money, then for their animals, their livestock, then for their land, and lastly for uh, themselves. We saw how Joseph introduced urbanism, you know, people were moved into the cities. We saw how Joseph introduced a, a feudal system where they all worked for Pharaoh and paid a 20% a tax. And we saw in the end of the chapter how Jacob made sure that if that when he would die, that he would be buried in Israel. And that's really where chapter 48 continues, the end of Jacob's life. And in chapter 48, we find that Jacob blesses Joseph and his two sons. And we will see in the next chapter, 49, that he blesses all his sons. And we will see when we get there. And we will look forward a little bit when we uh, look at chapter 48, but the details we'll get, Lord willing, next week. We see that we will see that chapter 49 really is a prophecy about the nation of Israel, uh, some of which has been fulfilled already, or partially fulfilled, but some of it is still future. But that's that's for next week. Today we're going to look at chapter 48, of course, and. In chapter 48, we see Jacob, very briefly, looking back on his life, again, just as he did in the previous chapter, but then also, as it were, looking forward with regard to Joseph's family and his two sons. Now, before I say anything else, let's read the chapter. And I, I want to read two more passages uh, to, to put what is before us in this chapter into a little bit more context. But first we'll read Genesis chapter 48. It came to pass after these things that one told Joseph, Behold, thy father is sick. And he took with him his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim. And one told Jacob and said, Behold, thy son Joseph is coming to thee. And Israel strengthened himself and sat up upon the bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, The Almighty God appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan, that was chapter 28, and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee, and I will make of thee a company of peoples. I will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. And I had two sons who were born to thee in the land of Egypt before I came to thee in e into Egypt shall be mine. Ephraim and Manasseh shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon. Thy family which thou hast begotten after them shall be thine. They shall be called after the name of their brethren in their inheritance. And as for me, when I came to, from Paddan, Rachel died by me in the land of Canaan on the way, when there was yet a certain distance to come to Ephrath. And I buried her there on the way to Ephrath, that is, Bethlehem. And Israel beheld Joseph's sons, or probably perceived, but we will look into that, and said, Who are these? And Joseph said to his father, They are my sons whom God has given me here. And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, to me, that I may bless them. 
But the eyes of Israel were heavy from age, he could not see. And he brought them nearer to him, and he kissed them and embraced them. And Israel said to Joseph, I had not thought to see thee. And behold, God has, not, has let me see also thy seed. And Joseph brought them out from his knees and bowed down with his face to the earth. And Joseph took them both, Ephraim in his right hand, toward Israel's left hand, and Manasseh in his left hand, toward Israel's right hand. The right hand being the place of prominence. prominence. And he brought them near to him. But Israel stretched out his right hand and laid it on Ephraim's head, on the left. Now he was the younger, and his left hand on Manasseh's head, guiding his hands intelligently, or he crossed his arms or his hands, for Manasseh was the firstborn. And he blessed Joseph and said, The God before whom my fathers Abraham and Isaac walked, the God that shepherded me, or fed me, all my life long, to this day, the angel that redeemed me from all evil, bless the lads. And let my name be named upon them, and let the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and the name of my fathers Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the land, or in the midst of the earth. And when Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it was evil in his eyes. <coughs> he took hold of his father's hand to remove it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's hand. And Joseph said to his father, Not so, my father, for this is the firstborn. Put thy right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He also will become a people, and he also will be great. But truly, his younger brother will be greater than he and his seed will become the fullness of nations. And he blessed them that day, saying, In thee will Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh. And he said, Ephraim before Manasseh. And Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I die, and God will be with thee, with you, and bring you again to the land of your fathers. And I have given to thee one tract of land above thy brethren, which I took out of the hand of the Amorite with my sword and with my bow. Now let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 21, verse 17. <coughs> But he shall acknowledge as firstborn the son of the hated, by giving him a double portion of all that is found with him. For he is the first fruits of his vigour, the right of the firstborn is his. What I want to emphasize in this verse is that the right of the firstborn is a double portion. Now let's turn to the first book of Chronicles, chapter 5. 1 Chronicles, chapter 5, verse 1. And the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but inasmuch as he defiled his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. But the genealogy is not registered according to the birthright, for Judah prevailed among his brethren, and of him was the prince, but the birthright was Joseph's. So what we have in these two verses emphasizes the fact that Joseph is regarded as the firstborn and that Judah is regarded as the royal line. And it's important to keep that in mind when we look at chapter 48, but also when we look at chapter 49. Now we will look into the details of that, of course, this week and next week. Now when we look at the chapter that is before us today we see that Joseph that Jacob it, Jacob's life is coming to an end he had testified last week that his life was evil the days of his life were evil and that his life was short 
even when Jacob arrived in Israel, he realized, oh, sorry, in Egypt, he realized that, you know, most of his life was over and that he would soon die. And now that moment has come. He, was, he had turned sick, he had turned blind. It come to an end. But what I really find encouraging, and I think should be an encouragement to all of us, is the fact that when, when we look at Jacob's life, in general, we look at how he plotted, how he schemed, how he tried to do things his way. And of course, that's one of the great lessons we've been looking at in, in, in past chapters. But when we look at Jacob's end, and I, I've already mentioned that last week, we see that he ended or he finished well. And I think this is a, an encouragement for all of us. I think all of us will recognize something of Jacob in our lives. At least I do, and I think I won't be the only one. We recognize something of Jacob in all of us. But the good thing is, when, when, when Jacob reaches this stage in his life, he, he can be mightily used by God. We have looked at that in the previous chapter, him blessing Pharaoh, the mightiest man on earth probably. And now he, he prophesies, chapter 48, but especially chapter 49. And the encouragement is, although we might look like Jacob in many aspects of our lives, we can still be used by God. He still wants to use us. Okay, of course we need to acknowledge the things that we've done wrong and Jacob has done that. But there never is a point where, where we have to say, okay, my life is such a mess. Was such a mess. I've ruined everything. God will never be able to use me. I'm such a great sinner, God can never use me. You know, Paul says that he is the chief of sinners, the Apostle Paul. That was because he persecuted the assembly. Look at how God used, how he mightily used this chief of sinners. Look at how God uses this Jacob, who could testify of his own days that they were evil and short. That God can use this man. We find him worshipping in the previous chapter on, the, on his bed. Or as Hebrew says at the end of his staff. And the one thing that is mentioned. The two things that are mentioned of Jacob. In Hebrews 11. Are him worshipping and him blessing Joseph's sons. As, a, as an act of faith. So if you think you are like Jacob, that may be right. But you should never think that because you are like Jacob, God cannot use you. If you make things right, if you confess your wrongdoings, he wants to use you. Just as he used Jacob, he used Israel in these last chapters of his life, in the last chapters of this book. So Joseph hears that his father is sick. Sickness because of old age, as we already saw. And Joseph goes to him with Ephraim or and Manasseh, or I should say Manasseh and Ephraim, because the, the order isn't reversed yet. And when Joseph comes to Jacob, Jacob strengthens himself. He, he gathers, as it were, all his energy and sits, sits up in the bed to speak to him or to them. And then from verse 3 onwards, we, we find that um, Jacob is looking back on a few of the things that he has experienced in his life. And he first goes back to that day in Bethel. 
We've looked at that when we looked at chapter 28. The Almighty God appeared to me. And we see that with all the failings that there were in Jacob's life. That was a formative moment. The Almighty God appeared to me at Luz or Bethel, the house of God in the land of Canaan, and blessed me. And he said to me, Behold, I will make thee fruitful and multiply thee and make of thee a company of peoples and will give this land to thy seed after thee for an everlasting possession. This verse is very relevant today, this week. You know, this week there were these disputes again. In, in, in Israel, between the, uh, the Jews and the Pal uh, Palestinians, the Palestines. But God says here, that land, or Jacob says, God said, that land will be for your family, for an everlasting position. Now, I don't want to get into the, the, the political events, uh, the, the, the civil war that is taking place in Israel at the moment. But here we see that God promised this to Jacob. And we know that one day the Lord Jesus will reign. Not in Washington DC. Not in London. Not in Brussels. Or any other city. He will reign in Jerusalem. And it will be from there and we will look into a, a bit more detail of all that, of course, next week. But it is from there that blessing will go out into the world. It's an everlasting position. God promised this to Jacob. He had promised it to Abraham. And God always keeps his word. And he will make that promise come to pass. But it was a... It was a formative moment in Jacob's life. I will make thee fruitful. And we've seen already that partially that had come into fulfillment. There were 70 something souls, 74. We've looked at that. But we've also seen that when we get to the book of Exodus, there were probably a couple of million. Fruitfulness. Because God blessed his people. And then he refers to the two sons of Joseph. Jacob here is speaking to Joseph. You shouldn't forget, he is blind. He hasn't seen Ephraim and Manasseh. He is speaking to Joseph only at this moment. Thy two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, shall be mine as Reuben and Simeon. <coughs> Jacob, as it were, takes these, these two sons and makes them his own. And from the very first time he mentions the names of the two sons, he reverses the order. Manasseh is the firstborn. The second is Ephraim. But he reverses that. And because he knows, and we, will, and we have read about that, that Ephraim will be the first. He puts the first emphasis on Ephraim. When Jacob was blessed by his father, his father did so unintelligently. Because Isaac thought that he was blessing Esau. But as Jacob pretended to be Esau, Jacob received Esau's blessing for himself. But here, Jacob, or rather Israel, knew exactly what was right to do. And we have uh, read uh, in verse 14 that he guided his hands intelligently. This, this, this wasn't by accident or, or, or just happened to be so. No, he knew. He knew what was going to happen, and I'll, I'll say more when we, we get to those, to those verses. But 
Ephraim is the first. And he says, Ephraim and Manasseh will be mine as Reuben and Simeon. This is how Ephraim and Manasseh became two tribes in Israel. Now you wonder, maybe, I can remember that I wondered when I was younger, how is this possible? You know, Israel had 12 sons, and one of these sons is turned into two tribes, and yet there are 12 tribes. You know, you learn in primary school that 11 plus 2 is 13. How does that work? Now, when we look at the 12 tribes, we look at the whole of Israel, but Levi is then not looked at, 9 out of 10 times, as a tribe. The 12 tribes received an inheritance. They received part of the land. This is done uh, later in the books of Moses, and it comes into practice in Joshua. Twelve tribes receive an inheritance, but Levi does not receive an inheritance. They are dispersed throughout the land. Now we will, again, we will look at uh, into more detail next week. But Joseph's tribe, the tribe of Joseph as such, is never mentioned as such. It is Ephraim and Manasseh. So when we look at the whole, two tribes of Joseph, a double share. And that is why I read those verse, that verse in, in Deuteronomy uh, 21, where we see that the right of the firstborn is a double portion. Joseph was placed as the firstborn, and obviously he was the, the firstborn of Rachel. Rachel, remember, was the woman that Jacob loved. Ja Rachel was Jacob's first love, as it were. It was Rachel he worked for. And then he got Leah. And we've, we've looked at all that. Joseph was Rachel's firstborn. And when, when we look at the big picture, and again we will uh, look into more details of that next week, but when we look at Joseph, it says of Joseph in chapter 49, Joseph is a fruitful bough. The word there that is used in the Hebrew for bough is also the word that is translated son in other places in this and many other chapters. I think it's almost used 5,000 times in the Old Testament. But the remarkable thing is, in chapter 49, we have only two sons mentioned with that word. Okay, the, the sons of Israel, you know, as a whole are mentioned, there the word is used. But then only for Judah and for Joseph, this word for son or bow is used. Now, if you look that word up in your Strong's Concordance, it'll say something like, Son, as in a builder of the family name. Okay, so Joseph and Judah would build the family name. Now, what have we read in 1 Chronicles 5? We saw that the birth, birthright was Joseph's. And we've seen that Ephraim would take the first place. And when we go to later books in the Old Testament, for instance, Hosea, but also in other places, we, we find that the name Ephraim is used to indicate Israel, a builder of the family name, Joseph. But we've also read in 1 Chronicles 5 that the royal line would be Judah. And this will continue to be so. Judah would provide the first king after God's own heart, David. And we know that the Lord Jesus was a descendant, as a man here on earth, he was a descendant from Joseph. Both 
Oh, sorry, from David. Both Mary and Joseph, his not biological father, but the, the one who was looked at at his father, and the Lord Jesus acknowledged him as his earthly father because we read in Luke 2 that he was obedient to his parents, that was Joseph and Mary, they were both from the royal line, from the line of Judah. They were from the line of kings. And it is these two lines that have characterized Israel throughout history and will continue to characterize Israel into the future. Now I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit into the second half of the chapter, but I just want to give you that that, that, that overview so you, you know what, what I'm talking about. And when we look at Ephraim, who is made first, I, I already mentioned that Ephraim is more or less synonym to Israel in, uh, in later books in the Old Testament. But we also find that Ephraim takes prominence. I think one good example is uh, Ezekiel 37. I don't want to you know, get into the details of all that, that would take us uh, too far away from, from what we have before us now. But we see that these things that Jacob prophesied in his blessing, they have come to pass in partial fulfillment and will be completely fulfilled when we get to the millennium. These blessings, and we've, I know we've looked at that on previous occasions where this happened, these blessings very often contain something prophetic. This is something that was typical for the days in, in which these people lived. This is not something we do today. We don't prophesy. No, I, I won't prophesy over my children what they will become. Because when it comes to prophecy, prophecy is connected with this earth. Prophecy is predominantly connected with Israel. Not always, but most of it. And when it comes to us in the church period, we're not looking at this earth. We have a heavenly calling. We have a heavenly hope. We have heavenly blessings. But let's, let's go back to what, what is before us in this chapter and let's look at some, some other things that Jacob is, as it were, reflecting back on. He's looking back on his wife, looking back on how she died, where she died. And I think this is quite important too. In verse 7, Jacob reminisces about the death of his wife. Rachel, as I said earlier, was his first love. And she is a picture of Israel. Rachel was the great, great, I don't know how many great grandmothers, mother of the first king of Israel. Rachel was the mother of Benjamin. And Saul was a Benjaminite king. Rachel pictures Israel. Rachel dies. Israel is put out of sight. We have seen with the first burial that burying means putting out of sight. Now we've seen how the burial of Sarah depicts something similar. Sarah was put out of sight. Israel was put out of sight, was set aside for the moment in order that the church might be brought in. We have looked at that in Genesis chapter 23 and 24. Now, in the same way, something similar we have in this verse. Rachel dies, is buried, and it is connected with Bethlehem, the house of bread. And we know that the Lord Jesus speaks of himself in John 6 as the true bread from heaven. 
we know that he was born in Bethlehem. So we could say that in a nutshell, we have that same message here again. Israel is put out of sight, out of sight and Christ is brought in. And when it comes to blessing, when it comes to the fulfillment of prophecy, Christ is the key. Had he, and this is obviously human, uh, you know, a, a human perspective, humanly speaking, had he not died, there would be no millennium. Had he not died, we wouldn't be saved. Had he not died, and had he not been raised on the third day, we would be the miser most miserable of all men, Paul says. But it is in the person of the Lord Jesus that everyone will be blessed. We've seen the promises to Abraham that in his seed the entire earth, the whole earth, would be blessed. And this is because Messiah would come. Christ would come. Remember, Messiah, the anointed one in Hebrew, Christ, the anointed one in Greek. Christ is the center. And just as Christ is the center in God's purpose, in God's plans for this earth and for eternity, he should be the center for our lives. He should be the focal point. Earlier this week, in, in our local Bible reading, we're in 1 Corinthians 5, which is not a very uplifting chapter. But we, we, we talked about the fact that if Christ is our focal point, if we have Christ and Him crucified before us, as in the Passover in uh, 1 Corinthians 5, We are not so much inclined to fall into sin because we have him before us. Because we have before us what he has done for us. How he has suffered. Because that is what the, the Passover speaks of. The Passover lamb roasted on the fire. It's exposed to the heat directly. The judgment of God. The bitter herbs. Well, we're not going to talk about the Passover now. But just, just to, to make that parallel, that if we have Christ before us, we, Satan will have great difficulty getting a hold of us, on us, making us sin. And here Christ has to be brought in, in order that God's purpose, God's plans would be fulfilled. Now, when I read verse 8, I said, And Israel beheld, or perceived. Now, why did I say that? A couple of lines down, in verse 10, it says, He could not see. So why does it say here, And Israel beheld Joseph's sons? In other words, Israel saw them, but he could not see. Now, if you, again, look up this word in your Strong's Concordance, you will find that this word in Hebrew means a variety of things. And it, mean, and it does not literally mean to see. It can also be in a figurative sense. To perceive that someone else is present. That is what happened here. Israel perceived Joseph wasn't alone. And he says, who is with you? And then he starts to speak to the two sons also. Joseph says, they are my sons whom God has given me here. And Jacob said, Israel says, bring them, I pray thee, to me, that I may bless them. <coughs> In verse 11, Israel looks back on the fact that he lost Joseph. In a way, he, he says, I, had, I thought that I would never see you again. And now I've not only seen you... I have also seen your sons. God has let me see also thy seed. 
And then jo Joseph brings the two sons to his father. And if there ever was a moment in Joseph's history, as far as the word of God is concerned, where Joseph failed, uh, I, I don't like to use the word fail here, but this is the, the one time we see that Joseph wasn't perfect. He missed the spiritual understanding in, in, in this point, probably because it, it had to do with his sons. I don't want to speculate about that. But he failed to understand that Ephraim would take the first place. That Ephraim, who was the youngest, would take the place of the oldest. This has been a theme throughout the book of Genesis. We can look at Ishmael and Isaac, and of course there man's ways had come in. But clearly when we look at Esau and Jacob, we see that God made sure that the younger one would receive the greater blessing. And here we see God doing that again. And again when we look at the great picture, the first man, Adam, has to be put aside in order that the second man, Christ, can be brought in. God's ways are not our ways. And this is the one time where Joseph does not understand God's ways. But let's not criticize Joseph for this, this, this one mishit. I've already mentioned that Jacob knew what he was doing, that he intelligently crossed his arms. And he put his right hand on the younger son and his left hand on the older son. The right hand is the place of prominence. I've already mentioned that at the, the beginning. We see this with the Lord Jesus now. He is seated not at God's left hand. No, he is seated at God's right hand and I think that's the supreme example to tell us that the right hand is the place of prominence and that and, and Joseph knew this that is why he put his oldest son there first but Jacob he reverses the order and then in in what Jacob says we see that he not only intelligently acted as, as far as uh, Joseph's sons were concerned, but he also looks back on his life again intelligently. And there's some remarkable things that he says in his blessing to the two, for the two boys. He says in verse 15, The God that shepherded me all my life long to this day. Now if we were to look back, and we've done that already. We've already. I've already mentioned that Jacob took matters into his own hands. He plotted and schemed and planned and did whatever he could to, could to have things his way. But we've already seen that when he flees for Laban, that he acknowledges that God's hand was with him. And here we see that he acknowledges that God was with him all the way, all his life. Now I would suggest to you that it is good every now and then to look back and not to say that the former days were better. There is a verse I think in Ecclesiastes that tells us very clearly not to do that. But to see how God worked in your life. And in my life, how he planned things, how he, some translations have fed us, but I, I like the word shepherd better because shepherding is not just, you know, giving some food. Now I feed my hens every day, but I don't shepherd them. They're fenced in, they're, they're going nowhere. But shepherding shows that there is, there is something more than just giving some food. It was giving care. It's the shepherd's care for his sheep. 
Here we see that Jacob acknowledges that God took care of him every day of his life. In the same way, he is taking care of you and me. And then in verse 16, he says, the angel, not an angel, the angel, which is a reference probably to the Lord Jesus, but definitely to God, that redeemed me from all evil. Now, this is the first time the word redeem is used in the word of God. This is the first time that God is referred to as the Redeemer. I know that historically maybe Job had, has lived before, um, before Jacob and Job referred to God as his Redeemer. But when we look at the order of the books in the Bible, this is the first time. This is the first time God is revealed to us as the Redeemer. He redeemed me out of, of from all evil and then he said that God that God who shepherded me all my life you know if that God would have shepherded Abraham that was one thing because Abraham was fr God's friend but it's the God that shepherded Jacob it's the God who shepherded the man who wanted to do things his way that God that God that redeemed Jacob of all evil, that God bless the lands. And it's that same God, brothers and sisters, who is going his, his way with you and me, who is looking after us day by day, who knows what befalls us, who knows what we are going through. It's that God that has everything in his hand. It is that God that is taking care of you and me. And then he says, my name be named upon them. I've already referred to Hosea where we find Ephraim and Israel connected again and again. Just read through the verses and you will see how Hosea speaks of Ephraim and Israel. My name be named upon them. And let them grow, at the end of verse 16, into a multitude in the midst of the land. Now the word for he, in the Hebrew for land can also be translated earth. I just said that as far as prophecy is concerned, it has to do with this earth. They will grow into a multitude. For this land. Now and obviously they were not in the land. They were in Egypt. And I think what Jacob has in view here is not just in inverted commas just Israel. There's blessing for the entire world. And again when we get to chapter 49 we'll, we will see more of that. We've already looked at, at Joseph's misunderstanding of this. I don't want to put, uh, spend more time on that. He, but I, I want to look a little bit at what Jacob says. Israel says in verse 19, his younger brother will be greater than he. We've seen that the firstborn son receives a double portion. And we've linked that with Joseph. Now if we think back on what we looked at in chapter 41 when Manasseh and Ephraim are born, we saw that Manasseh means forgetfulness and that Ephraim means double fruitfulness. So even there in chapter 41 we we already have a hint of what is happening here. Ephraim, double fruitfulness, receives a double portion. And I just want to link that again with uh, Ezekiel 37, where we find that Ephraim takes the prominence in Israel. He will be greater than he, and his seed will become the fullness of 
of nations. But it doesn't mean that Manasseh wouldn't have prominence at all. Because in the next verse, Jacob says, In thee will Israel bless, saying, God make thee as Ephraim and Manasseh. And then Jacob, as it were, goes back to Joseph, goes back to the, the bigger picture, and he says in verse 21, Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I die, and God will be with you. Now, the older English translations have an advantage when it comes to D, the difference between D and U. D is always singular, U is always plural. I'm not saying that you know everyone should read an, an old an old-fashioned English translation, but this is one of the big benefits. If you read a more modern translation, you will find that it is U in verse 21 and it is U in verse 22. Whereas there is a difference. Verse 21, Jacob is speaking about the bigger picture. He doesn't say just to Joseph or about Joseph, God will be with you and bring you again to the land of your fathers. He's not looking at Joseph, but he's looking at his family. And obviously, this is not about Joseph and his brothers returning to the land of Canaan. We know that Joseph did return there. In a box. Bones. We've seen already that some 400 years later, the whole of Israel, the people of Israel, would return to the land. And this is what Jacob, Israel, has in view. He says, God will be with you. God will multiply you. And we've seen how enormously the people would grow in these 400 something years and bring you again to the land of your fathers. And then in verse 22, we, we get revealed to us something that we haven't seen before. Clearly, from what we have here, Jacob has been at war with the Amorites and he's conquered land. We don't know when, we don't know why. When we looked at Jacob's life, we saw a pilgrim. We saw that he bought land from the Amorites, from Hemor. But here we see that he fought for land. And then he says, And I have given to thee, that is, to Joseph, one tract of land, one portion of land. Now, if we, if we go to Joshua, chapter 24, it says there, in verse 32, The bones of Joseph, I already referred to them, which the children of Israel had brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in the portion of the field which Jacob had bought. There was war involved as well for whatever reason. But what it says here is that Joseph was buried in Shechem. It says in verse 22 of our chapter, I have given to thee one tract, one portion. And the word for portion in Hebrew is Shechem. We've already seen when looking at chapter 41 that that is Sychar in John 4 where we find the true Joseph at the well. So I don't want to refer to that again. But this is where Joseph receives something. A specific piece of inheritance. Shechem means shoulder. And the shoulder often speaks to us of strength. And we will look at Joseph in more detail when we get to 
the next chapter. I, I know I've promised that a few times already. But we'll, get, we'll get more details of that next week. But Jacob gave Joseph a specific inheritance in Israel. And I don't want to speculate about the how and what about this war and how that works out with, with buying the land. Clearly, it was Jacob's. Jacob had the possession and he gave it to Joseph. And it was for the blessing of Joseph. Joseph, that was Joseph's hope. When Joseph dies, he says, I don't want to be buried in this land. Joseph's focus was on the land of his inheritance. Joseph's focus was not on Egypt. No doubt he had gathered much in Egypt. No doubt he could have had himself build a pyramid. No doubt he could have, you know, made sure that his family never left Egypt because they had everything they, you know, humanly speaking, they ever would need. But Joseph's focus was not on those material things. Joseph's focus was on God's promise. I know I'm jumping ahead a little bit to the end of the book, but because it comes before us here, I just want to highlight that. Where Joseph's focus lied, lies, that is where our focus should be. Not on the literal land of Israel. I remember a conversation a couple of years ago with a sister who had been to Israel. She's been looking forward to that, you know, being in the land. And she said to me, you know, I had, I had expected something special, but I felt nothing. It was a disappointment. And of course I can understand that. And I'm not saying that we should never go and visit Israel. Don't get me wrong. You know, when one, one of the, I think, 12 countries or so that we are allowed to visit at the moment, no, the red and the green list because of COVID is Israel. We don't have to quarantine when we get back. The question is, do you want to go to Israel with what is going on there at the moment? And I'm not saying you shouldn't go there. But it, it is not our hope. Of course, I would love to go to Israel. You have to see the places where the Lord has been and all these historical sites. But it's not where our focus is. Our focus is not on something here on earth. Our focus is in heaven. We are but strangers here. Heaven is our home. And we've often seen that, looked at that, in the pilgrim life of Abram, Isaac and Jacob. And now we see something similar with one of the richest men, no doubt, here on earth. He was one of the mightiest men here, here on earth. And he says, I don't want a pyramid. I want to be buried there where my inheritance is. And in the same way, I've already said earlier today, our focus should be on the Lord Jesus. Our focus should be on Christ and Him crucified. And on the other hand, we can say, our focus should be on there where He is. We see Him crowned with glory and honor. He wants us to be there with Him. When we looked at chapter 24, Eliezer gave, uh, received a specific instruction not to bring the woman, the wife-to-be, sorry, not to bring Isaac to the wife-to-be, but to get the wife and bring her to Isaac. And we've seen how that is a picture of the church being brought to Christ. It was Re Rebecca's desire to be with Isaac. It was Joseph's desire to be in the land. And it should be our desire to be with the Lord Jesus. We know it's his desire that we should be with him. And it should be our desire to be with him. Be, be with the one 
who has paid the highest price. Be with the one who loves us so much.